Sukin Lee isn't afraid of taking chances. Throughout her career, the multimedia artist and broadcaster has probed the limits of what artists can say and do at the risk of losing audiences or even employment. In a new collaboration with Canadian Stage, she's created a performance documentary exploring the intricate tensions between art and censorship. It's called Unsafe. It's running now in Toronto through March 31st. And it brings Sukin Lee to our studio. Hi! Hi. Yeah, I'm so great to see you. Much music in the Woo. house. Yeah. You're I don't know why best. I feel like I'm bouncing or dancing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, throughout your career, uh, you've done many things. You and I work together at Much Music. Yes. And a lot of people know you from the CBC for definitely not the opera. How would you describe the work that you do? I don't know. I feel like um, probably so much of the through line of what I do in terms of creative work, films and music and um, theater and my broadcasting experience uh, and journalism is about communication, communicating and uh, making contact, meaningful contact with people, mm -hmm. hearing their stories and then taking what I'm learning and hopefully turning it around and sharing that, those perspectives with an audience. And, and, uh, and the way that you've done that has been through art, the communication. Yes. Um, you've actually said in a previous interview that I heard recently that art saved your life. It did. Uh, in what ways? In, in a lot of ways. So um, my parents were both uh, first-gen immigrants to Canada and a very arduous uh, experience for both of them. Um, ha my dad having been an orphan during World War II and my mom having grown up during um, communist, the communist um, communism in, in China, both made their way to Canada mm -hmm. and kind of fish out of water, trying to understand where it was, how to be. And they ended up um, raising their family in a white suburb in North Vancouver and experienced quite a bit of isolation. My mother was also battling mental unwellness and uh, a legacy of uh, abuse within her family that kind of really um, d damaged her in a way, but then she had to be a mother to four children mm -hmm. and, you know, being isolated like that really took its toll. So I think um, a great part of my communication comes from um, being within that family structure and having um, experienced a kind of intense home life where on the outside everything looked perfect perfectly manicured gardens and lawns and homes, but behind every closed door was a private life drama unfolding. And in my house, it was a world that was full of uh, tension, uh, confusion, violence, and trying to make sense of them, that as a child. You know, my parents really wanted us to succeed in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of rules and regulations and a lot of um, aggravation in terms of hoping to to uh, fit in into mm -hmm. this society. And so I think um, having been ex exposed to that and then leaving home very young at 15 you years 15. old, I ran away from home at that time because it became quite untenable. Um, understanding what it is to have the greatest love of my life, my mom, mm -hmm. also become very damaged and fearful and angry and turning into herself. Uh, that to me was an incredible disconnect and very confusing. And I think so much of so much of my work is about trying to understand the the complexities of the human mind, vis-a-vis -vis through somebody that I love that turned into someone who is very very abusive to you, my sisters and I. So trying to make sense of that that relationship, which of course finds itself in many manifestations in the world in terms of power and fear, communication and love, mm -hmm. uh, that all drives, all drives my stories. And it does drive my journalism and broadcasting work in terms of trying to understand each other. And I want to talk about power and institutions yes. and way they, where they lie uh, when we talk about censorship. Um, but I, I think it's very, when I look back at your life, because I also left home when I was really mm -hmm. young, when I was 16, um, I wonder if you would have been able to do the art that you have done had you not gone through that. No, I would not have. I wouldn't have had the sense of personal urgency and a desire for meaningful connection, use, utility and usefulness in the work. I you know, love the craft and I love beauty and I love being able to tell a story in a movie, say for example, but also it must hit the sort of head, heart and funny bone. There must be something other than just entertainment value in terms of a kind of um, a quality or, or um, engagement that I wish to, to 
share with people. And speaking of movies, uh, you uh, had a role in the film Short Bus, and you almost got fired from CBC uh, where you were working at. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, before we get yeah, into okay. it, uh, this is probably one of the only clips we could show from Short Bus. Uh, I want to show you the clip and then we can talk more. OK, sounds right. good. Sheldon, please roll. Sophia, if you've never had an orgasm, then how does it feel like for you to have sex? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> sex is really awesome. Yeah. I love sex. <laughs> we all know that, right? Yeah. We all know that, that sex feels terrific. Mm, that's great. I, don't know. I, I love it. Love it a lot. It's a great workout. Feels good. And I love, you know, loving my husband. It's just, you know, there comes a point sometimes where it just gets really a lot of pressure and kind of like, ah, it feels a little bit, ah, kind of like, um, like, uh, like somebody's gonna kill me and I just have to, you know, smile and, and pretend to enjoy it, you know, and that way I can survive. I mean, I don't think anybody was buying what you were selling until the very <laughs> last point when you say where you survive, which is really heartbreaking. Yes, uh, so, so Sophia is um, a type A, high achieving, you know, total control freak. She's a sex therapist who has a terrible sex life herself, but, you know, wants to help other people in their terrible sex lives. Um, and, um, yeah, so she's a portrait of a woman very tightly determined and ambitious, but entirely cut off from her, her, her body and her feelings mm -hmm. and her, yeah, her, her being. So it's not until her life hits rock bottom and everything falls apart and she has no control anymore mm -hmm. that she's able to surrender to pleasure for the first time. So it was kind of, yeah, it, it short bus in, in a lot of ways, it was a, it's a groundbreaking LGBTQ film. Um, and it was a lot about humanistic um, relationships, lovers, troubled, troubled relationships that take place kind of in the bedroom. The sexual dynamics of the bed and those kind of conflicts therein. But the plot kind of got lost because uh, a lot of people when they were talking about that film was about the nudity and on camera you actually self-pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what happened when this came out? Because you were working at CBC at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, so I had been developing the movie for quite some time. The movie was rendered through improvisations where we created our own characters. So I had been given the okay by my manager to partake in the movie. But once we got financing and the original website, you would log on and you'd see two men making love. When the managers above my manager saw it, they're like, ah, ah, you know, and they're like, oh no, you can't, get, get, like it was on lockdown. And then I saw one of the men, then my manager deferred to his manager because there's this fear, a tower of fear in very many workplaces, especially if you're talking about an institutional place. Mm -hmm. Everybody's afraid of taking responsibility for a decision. So it was like, hey, I want this movie in my life, but if I can't make the decision anymore. I'm going to bump it up. And I saw that next manager in the elevator, and he said, you know, Sikian, if you're even nude in this movie, you can't do it. And I'm like, but I was, I've been naked in other movies. I was working at City TV down the street, much music. He's like, no, well that's, that's fine for them, but not us. Because they're private and this is public? Or whatever, yeah. our, our listeners will be outraged. And I was like, oh God, good grief. There's a puritanical guy who hasn't seen the movie, thinks it's a porno, doesn't realize it's an art movie. It ended up premiering to a 20 minute standing ovation at the Cannes International Film Festival, which is the Olympics of movies. Anyway. And you had a lot of famous people supporting you. Yeah, Francis Coppola, Yoko Ono, the list goes on. Like every notable um, American and Canadian filmmaker came to bat for us because the CBC thought it was a porno and only had it in their mind that it was a porno and that their audience would freak out. So, you know, I went to above him to the top person and said, hey, your right hand person is gonna be a little uneducated within this. Maybe you should talk to me about it and I can tell you what it is. That conversation never happened because there was just too much fear. And then it was just like, when they caught wind of it, they were like, okay. And they'll never say you're fired. Mm -hmm. That's, institutions don't operate like that. They're much more passive aggressive. We will end your contract. Right. <laughs> so, so, but what is that? Because you're uh, not at the CBC anymore. Um, but that was, I mean, that was before. So yeah. that was, you know, with Short Bus, if you're in the movie, we'll end your contract. But it wasn't until artists got behind me mm -hmm. and then the public saying, hey, wait a minute, why are you trying to control what she's doing on her own time? And then the CBC kind of went, okay, 
oh, we thought people would be freaked out. And that we was a the lot. Canadians would be freaked out, but they were freaked out because they were trying to control uh -huh. what I was doing. So it was a good sort of moment to reevaluate because they just assumed that Canadians were puritanical and, you know, um, would reject it, but they were much more open-minded. So it was an important point for the institution to pass through, which also gave rise to, you know, important work conversations about, mm -hmm. you know, employee and autonomy and what employees can and cannot do in their, in their lives. I want to um, follow up with something that you just said a few times. Sure. You mentioned the word fear. Yes. And you address this in the, uh, what you're calling a docu-performance in Unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, what role does fear play uh, when we talk about censorship and the conversation around censorship? Well, censorship is about control. And I do think every, every uh, manifestation of control, whether you're afraid of how you look and so you self-censor online, um, myriad uh, myriad things arise from the need to control, i.e. censorship, uh, based in the root of fear. And I think that uh, fear is likely with us for good reason. If a rhinoceros is chasing you, you get out of the way. Mm -hmm. you know, but I don't even think that's fear. I mean, the fear happens after he's the rhino's like around the corner and you went, holy smokes, mm -hmm. I almost got mowed down by a rhino. But in that moment, you're probably instinctive, like in instinctively going, oh, just step out of the way. But I do think that fear serves a purpose, but it also is not a great place to make a decision. A decision made based on fear is not always a great decision. And though an entirely human experience and one that we wrestle every day and every moment are fears and anxieties and confusions, m much of the time we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Don't let's not talk about all the things that we think are icky. We'll just censor them, mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, and it's kind of hard to do that now with social media because before we had a lot of gatekeepers. And mm -hmm. in Unsafe, you actually have a, an interview with uh, Matthew Jocelyn, who's the former head of Canadian Stage, uh, who hired you. I'm so glad you're seizing on this line yes. because some people do not. It's lost on them. Mm. Well, we we kind of know it, <laughs> but anyway, um, but. Uh, and I also saw the play. Um, yes. So, it so you, you, we, we start talking about the institutions, the gatekeepers. Yeah. Um, and you ask him, one of the things that you were concerned with was whether you were being hired because of all the feedback of, you know, um, maybe Canadian stage not having enough, um, being, being an inclusive place and yes. having people from different backgrounds. It's an extraordinary um, interview. Um, and, you were, and you worried about being a, a check box, like a, a mark, a check mark on a diversity yes. box. Yes. Why was that? Well, because, I mean, um, First of all, the, the whole piece begins with an extraordinary interview with Matthew Jocelyn, the former Canadian stage artistic director. And he's a guy who's 60 years old, admittedly a white privileged guy who had been hired because he was supposed to bring an international flair to a kind of local provincial um, theater company. So he did 10 years ago deliver on the fantastic, mm -hmm. you know, French world international flair, you know, to make it a, you know, a competitive theater company. But ideas like, so I had been tasked with exploring art and censorship in this production. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear to me early on that art and censorship, capital C cases of taking an artist to court and trying them for, you know, possible, you know, offensive material doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Those are very difficult court cases to try. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. Um, and so that sort of fascination with the kind of censorship that happened 25 years ago, of which Matthew was intrigued by, specifically mm -hmm. the painter Eli Langer, who was accused of um, painting child pornography 25 years ago, went to court, the case was thrown out because uh, the work was considered of artistic merit and didn't qualify as child, child pornography. Mm -hmm. That was his original fascination. So he hired um, Zach Russell, an artist who hired me to cr create a work. Zach was more interested in art and censorship today. So that's where I came in. And it became very clear that it is no longer the idea that Matthew is considering, but um, it's more about the control isn't like it goes away. It's more like who has access to the media, who is excluded, and who is silenced. So I started to speak with a number of artists, and it became very clear to me, one after the other, you know, a disability activist artist uh, performing artwork, performance art at the AGO, um, suddenly being silenced by the institution because they are speaking 
about systemic white supremacy and violence that they had experienced within that space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, finding out that that, that interview had been pulled, um, talking to um, musicians who feel that they have, like for every fantastic Juno Award, Canadian Screen Award, whatever award, you have to pay huge and expensive submission fees just to be eligible for the award. So what does that say about exclusion and who has access and who gets heard? Well, that's entirely dictated by class and money. We're suddenly real, you know, if you don't realize it, you just think, oh, they're the best, you know? Very naked how ladies you, are the best. So, because there's some people who will think that, you know, everything should be based on merit. Um, and how, do you, how do you talk really, about that when you're talking about censorship? And it's really hard to say. We think it is. It's like merit. It must be the best thing. But mm -hmm. like if you're keeping, if the gatekeepers are keeping so many people out the door we, that we can't even consider them, unless they have big coin to pay to be inside the door, it's not really quite fair. And so this, this interview with Matthew Jocelyn is interesting because he is a guy who is now voluntarily giving up his position. He walked away, he resigned, and he was like acknowledging that the world is changing and for it, Canadian states to be more viable and to actually reflect Canadians that they are publicly funded to do, mm -hmm. that it has to, he has to like sort of give up control, pass the torch over to others, i.e. not necessarily white um, privileged people. But the, the topic that you're talking about, um, you're talking about censorship, you're talking a little bit about color culture. Mm -hmm. um, did you consider that, that as a woman and as a racialized woman that you were actually putting a mark on your back because yeah, it made me think, you're, you know, you're making yourself a target? I, I've never really thought about that. Like, I do find that when I was a, in, when I was a, you know, a weird punk rock musician and in, mm -hmm. into indie art rock, I just felt free to express myself. And yet it was the media who would always try to put me into a box. What is it like to be a woman in rock? It's so kind of reductive mm -hmm. to be all that you can be and then suddenly only be referred to as a, a woman in rock. Similarly so, it struck me, it was like, hmm, I know that Matthew had approached only white men for this, this uh, commission, and then it was only one of the white men that hired me to collaborate, Zach Russell. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And so it did dawn on me, am I just a box tick? Because everybody knows that they have to be diverse now. Mm -hmm. But if diversity is being seen through the lens, through a white lens, by the gatekeepers who go, oh, who can we get? And yet it's still, like we're, we're here on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Like whose agenda is it and why am I hired? Is it because I'm, is it because I'm talented or is it because I have a Asian face. I've had that same <laughs> feeling. Of course. Um, we're running out of time though. Um, I wanted to show, cause in the play, you show a lot of yourself, um, but I want to show this uh, picture that you, you use at the play. And for anyone listening to our podcast, uh, it's Edward Manet's Luncheon on the Grass. Um, and the second is your recreation of the painting. And in it, um, there's yes. a lot of Suk Kyun Lee and yep. a, uh, a bar uh, <laughs> yeah. hiding things. Um, <laughs> what, what were you trying to say? Yeah, so I am very vulnerable. Like I use the body and, the, and, and, and um, throughout my work, I have used my body in in this manner, it's not necessarily beautific, although the, the original painting is beautific, but what I'm doing on stage is very matter of fact. There is no erotic kind of quality, or I'm not trying to like look sexy in it. I'm just like very banally mm -hmm. <laughs> taking my clothes off and getting dressed. In that regard, it's metaphorical. Um, a person, a woman, mm -hmm. me, being incredibly vulnerable and raw, while the man is fully clothed in the classical form, and kind of like trying to bring awareness of like the vulnerability and rawness and risk mm -hmm. involved in having to push forward and hopefully create these kinds of conversations within a classical structure contained in this tableau where the man is fully clothed and pointing at me and I am butt naked. I'd like to see him butt naked too. But you know what, it's, I, I was watching the play and um, in it you raised uh, some issues. You talked a little bit about Gian Gomeshi. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, a relationship that broke up as uh, during the course of the making of the play. Yes. Um, and someone stalking you. Yeah. Um, and I felt that- These were very you, important you, Very important, but I actually thought that you've, you were more comfortable being without clothes than actually going deeper in those issues. Uh, no, I mean, I feel like 
those are very specific issues. Um, Why include them in the play? Yeah, so uh, specifically the breakup. I wanted to be transparent and tell the truth within my relationship. Mm -hmm. And I always am compelled to try to tell the truth because I wish to tell the truth. And it's that moment where the truth bites your butt. It's not always that the truth will set you free. There are quite a number of times where maybe you got to shut it because there will be unfortunate consequences as it did have in my relationship. Censorship. Yes. Yeah. And in terms of the stalking moment, I did not want to talk about my stalker within the play, but my co creator was like, no, it's so interesting, because he's of the imagination. He thinks like, oh, it's an oblique moment. So interesting as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. But really, in my life, it's a real risk-taking moment. It is actually putting me in danger to speak about it. But he brought that up, and then I was like, screw it. I'm going to include it. Mm -hmm. That which I was afraid to talk about, I will, and I added it back in into the script. Why? Because I don't want to be fueled by fear. I do not wish to be locked in by the memory of this stalker that will dictate whether or not I can feel free to walk in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm happy now that I can walk at nighttime and I am not burdened by fear. I don't want to be a fearful person. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I am putting those seeds out there and it's up to people to draw upon them mm -hmm. and find significant or not. There are many people that see this that do not even get the power dynamic. They're like, well, why didn't you focus more on color culture? Because that's what I relate to. It's like, well, that's... Mm -hmm. Not, but it, of course, it, re it reflects people's experience and what resonates with them. And you also, I thought, which, which was really interesting, you were looking for balance in everything that you presented. Uh, Trying why, to. Why was that important? Again, wonderful yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, so as a journalist, we're taught, you know, balance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you cover one party, you must cover this party and that party. There's this notion that we're trying to strain for balance. I know working within an institution and within journalism, balance it's kind of bogus. Mm. You know, there's old rules like the journalistic, Canadian journalistic standards that say balance, but it's also a way to avoid meaningful conversation. Just because you get a quote from everybody doesn't mean it's balanced or fair. There's always a bias. Mm. So there's a whole new, like when I first started working at the CBC, there was the idea of like, you are the broadcaster. You never share anything of your personal experience because you must be the expert. Mm. And People come to you and you will never put your butt on the street to actually engage and have people ignore you because it feels too unsafe. Mm -hmm. the, the worst people to interview are police, politicians, and other journalists. They never want to talk about their stuff. They want to like do, mm -hmm. I think it's got to be reciprocal. I feel as a journalist and a person in this, on the planet, it must be, love is reciprocal. It's not just a one way give or take. Mm -hmm. You must have a circuit. So I mean, there's a whole new way, like I just did a lecture series at the U of T. They have a new department that bridges performing arts and media. Journalists, journalism students and performing arts students under the same umbrella, because that's where media is going now. Trump is tweeting on Twitter. Those are his, that's news. Mm -hmm. You know, news is no longer in these sort of ossified silos of like legitimate, you know, um, media. I think there's a whole new way of teaching now that says, it talks about the myth of objectivity. I like that idea. Just be honest about your bias and say, this is my bias and here's what I come with. Take it or leave it. I think in some regards that's much more truthful than trying to strive for this journalistic sense of balance, which is not actually reflective of fair Speaking. Uh, we've run out of time, but I really want to ask you one more question because uh, watching you on stage, um, who was that? Was that Sukhyun, the journalist, the artist, or you, the person? I think it's a combination of all three. Really, um, you know, I do see journalism, unlike um, my, you know, much of the backdrop of the story is the tension between Zach and myself, his desire to tell the, the story of art and censorship through a work of fiction, and my desire to reflect the reality the incredible reality of the people that I was talking to and what was unfolding in us trying to make it. Mm -hmm. There were so many obstacles, be it institutional resistance, people getting cold feet, economic concerns that were just obstacles. And as a storyteller, I was like, oh my God, this is writing itself because every obstacle equals conflict equals drama. And I, it's not up to me to fabricate a story on art and censorship. I must lean heavily into the truth that these people have shared with me in the interview. So I do feel that I've always felt that 
journalism is one of the tools and paintbrushes, the paints that I use to make my art. So it sort of fuses them all together. So Kian, so, thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Yeah, thank but um, you so much. Unsafe uh, gives us a lot to think about, and I think this is a conversation we're going to be having for a long time. For sure. Thank you so much. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.